can lie completely flat, and there's no issue with um, being left or right-handed. So spiral notebooks, if there's a spiral, it can influence variability, whether you're left or right-handed, and how you hold the paper, whether you do it more tilted or more straight. Uh, so yeah, we'll go talk about the app, and then go through our three approaches, and our conclusions. Okay, so we chose the Minneapolis parking app. Um, there's two different apps you can get. It's one's Minneapolis Parking or another one's Park Mobile, but they both go to the exact same thing. Park Mobile can go for other cities, so I have both. Um, so there's a few different things you can do. So like if you click on activity, it pulls up where you've parked in the past and like the zone number and like how much you spent. Um, and then park, if you click on that, it shows like just a map and like a dot of where you're at if you allow your location services. Um, and then you can enter a zone number. And so like if you're at a meter, like on campus, you know, there's typically those like rectangle pay stations that are not conveniently placed whatsoever. Um, and so you can use the app for like all of those meters. Uh, there's also lots around campus or just in Minneapolis in general that you can, um, they have a zone number for a pay station. You can walk up to the pay station and do it that way or you can more conveniently do it on the app. Um, and then there's a reserve option, which I'm terrified to use because I don't want to pay for reserve parking and then all of a sudden it's an event space and it's now $30 but you already paid your $10 to reserve it. So I'm not familiar with that setting, but you can, if you like zoom out, it shows up different spots where you can reserve parking and like how much that is. But let's see, if I'm not, I'm not going to try. Um, and then the last option is more. Um, so that's where you can see your vehicle because now most kind of pay lots. It requires you to enter in your like, license plate and like a, like a car description. Um, and then there's payment methods and you can have multiple payment methods like a card or PayPal or Apple Pay. Um, Whereas some areas don't allow certain payment methods, so it's beneficial to have multiple. Um, and then notifications, um, which would be like, your parking expires in 15 minutes. Um, you can set specific notifications so that you can be notified at different time lengths that you want. Um, account settings, and then if you have promotion codes, I would wish I knew how to get promotion codes because that'd be nice because I park on campus all the time. Um, and then like favorite zones, so like if you park in the same lot every day, you can favorite that zone. So then when you're parking, you can just click favorite and then park and it has saved like the amount of time that you want to park, which saves like 30 seconds. Um, and then like the privacy policy terms of use shenanigans like that. All right, so we did our first of the heuristic approach, and this was a bit hard to judge for the broad category rankings, but we did our best and got an average. Um, you can't see there's actually, it's not 56, it's like 5.6. Um, so the content, we was 4.5 out of 7, just because it's somewhat unclear when you first start what all of the tabs mean, um, because it says activity as opposed to like history, um, more it doesn't, you don't know until you look at it what it actually is. Um, and then with like vehicles, you don't know until you click on that that you can both look at your vehicles and add a vehicle or different things like that. The navigation was pretty simple. Um, there's only four main tabs, which is that activity, reserve, park, and more. And they're separated by actions. Um, although it would, could make sense to combine the reserve and park. The visual design is 4.6. It's a bit of an older aesthetic, and there's really only one color used, which is green. So it kind of gets boring, um, and it's not particularly visually appealing, but it's not meant to be used for an extended period of time, so that's not a huge issue. Functionality is a 4.7. Our users didn't experience any of these issues, but there were a lot of complaints on the App Store about people not being able to use it for their space or it not communicating with the city and then getting a ticket. So um, that can be an issue. And then inter it's pretty interactive. You can move the map to see other areas of the city if you like want to see where there might be parking, somewhere you're going. You can reserve in other areas of the city. So that's the broad category. And then some specific ones that we thought 
were useful for this app in particular was the readability. It's approximately a size 12 font, which is pretty standard for apps, although it's not huge um, in the map. But you can zoom in on the map if you want a bigger map. Um, the positioning is pretty standard. Bottom navigation, top search bar. Uh, that's pretty standard for a lot of apps, like Netflix has bottom navigation. Um, help and documentation. There is no getting started tutorial. Um, it just, when you first open up the app for the first time, it just gives you like a what's new page, which can be a bit complicated if you're not sure kind of where to start, you know, what is, you know, where can I reserve parking, you know, how long can I do it for, how far in advance. And there's no in-app help, you have to go more help and then it will direct you to their website. So you have to go to a separate site to actually get help. Um, aesthetic and minimalist design, there's really no excess information or writing. There's actually very little text at all. It's mostly graphics, which is nice. Um, consistency of layout, uh, especially between the two sections that use maps, the park and reserve, it looks exactly the same when you switch between them, which is nice, so that keeps some consistency. And the app loads pretty quickly, and it does not have loading screens once you're in the app, which is nice because people don't like loading screens at all. So that, that was pretty good. Uh, obviously, if you have a slower internet connection, it will be slower to load and start up. But if you have a normal Wi-Fi connection, it's, it's, it's good. So for usability testing, um, we used four subjects, three of which were undergraduate students. The fourth was my mom. All of them hadn't used the app even once. Um, a couple of them had heard about it. Um, they all used it on the iPhone. Um, three of which were the my mom with the iPhone 4. <laughs> <laughs> so then what I did um, is I rated them on the speed at which they used the app, um, because it's kind of the thing where it's like you get out of your car and you want to see how fast you can get through it because it's, um, it's cold outside in the winter and you want to go get to your event and do things. So the most important thing, in my opinion, is the, how fast you can get through the app. So what I did is I had them all start, um, start fresh, <coughs> download, or they didn't have the app, so I had them download it, and then they would enter a zone number, and they all use the same zone number and the same license plate, and then they would um, create an account, and this involved entering in the license plate number. And you have to, on the app, you have to create, you have to enter your zone number and enter the time you're going to use it. And then it prompts you to create an app, or create your account. And then, um, then, it, then you add your um, payment method, and then at the end you can adjust your time if you want. So, um, the average score for entering your zone, zone number and duration is 46 seconds. It takes about a minute to create your account, another minute to add your payment method. In total, the first time you use the app, it takes 2 minutes and 40 seconds. The second time you use the app, you're not going to have to create an account or add a payment method if you save it. So it'll take just under a minute the second time or, or every subsequent time after you've already used the app. It'll take 46 seconds to park your car. Um, verbals I got, a lot of positive feedback. Um, easy sign up process, they like the layout and the fact that they can use a QR code. They like that you can, they can use Space ID. They like that it looked a lot like Google Maps. They were familiar with the map feature. Payment page is pretty friendly. friendly. You have five or six different options for to pay for. The one negative comment that I got was that you, they feel like you should be prompted to create your account before you do anything else because it's kind of like, oh, cool, I'm already parked my car, and then it tells, tells you to go make an account. Um, my, and then. So oh, nonverbal feedbacks, um, there was some sign, that was kind of when they had to create an account. Um, pausing, there's like a point where after you like put your, put your like zone number in, you put your time in, you're like, well, what do I do now? And that was kind of a little confusing. I think there could be something more in that area. And then um, one thing I noticed is that people were kind of unsure about how much time they wanted to park for. They would do like 15 minutes and they do an hour. That kind of varies. It's kind of hard to gauge how long you'll be there. Um, one thing that they could do is add in a feature that says like, hey, like you can you can always add more time to this, so less is more in that sense. So we use the same four people for the survey. That's just a review of their demographics. Um, so this is the average scores for um, kind of the questions regarding the quality. So the overall just software quality. Um, so it ranges from one to seven. Um, so on the higher end, for just the overall quality, um, they thought the um, app contained like all necessary functions required that 
to pay for parking. Um, so like nothing was lacking, they were able to pay for parking with the functions that are in the app. Um, they found it simple to create an account. Um, it's a very straightforward process. Um, so that was the highest ranking. Um, and then it was, they disagreed, they did not think that they would need an assistance of another person to be able to navigate the system. So they don't need someone tech savvy to be able to pay for parking. It's very simple, pay, click. It's not very um, crazy as far as um, simplifying all that. Um, and then they thought it was not difficult to pay for parking using the system and then um, they were kind of indifferent about the color scheme of the app. It's not very aesthetically exciting, um, but it just doesn't really matter as far as the function for the parking. And they're not looking at it for a long time. Um, and then as far as um, design claims, so kind of in the app store, like what is said about the app and what you should be able to do with the, just the general description. Um, and kind of if you're parking a lot, in Minneapolis or on campus, um, whether they thought it's kind of a neutral to somewhat like if you're parking a lot, it's yeah, it's necessary to have the app installed on your phone. Um, and then they feel confident using the software system and then they think that they would use it um, when they were parking um, as opposed to um, the last one, like a traditional pay meter where they're not conveniently placed and you have to stay outside in the rain or in the snow um, to and into your card and get all that stuff out. So um, they would rather use the app. Um, that the organization of the app was intuitive. It was whether the like the icons were um, labeled or that it's not. Was that proper help and documentation is very important. Again, with the somewhat unsure about getting started and unclear that you don't create an account until after you've entered the zone number. What do you do when you've entered the zone number? Um, sometimes less color is not better. Oftentimes you don't want to clutter it up with too many different colors, but having only one color can sometimes be boring if the color is green and gray, basically. And the, a consistent layout makes learning the app easier. It's a lot easier to figure out when park and reserve look the same. If they looked vastly different, that would kind of be jarring to a user and you wouldn't really understand why they were different. For usability, um we found that a couple of people said the app could be a little bit easier to navigate, especially in that kind of like, you want to get through it really fast, it's that kind of the crunch time, it's, you don't want to sit there and pause. Once you um, know what to do, it's a little bit faster in the future, but initially that first time you use it, it could be a little bit better. And then um, there are a couple areas that are a little too busy. This kind of plays into the easy being easy to navigate. We found this to be the most useful because we got like a lot of positive feedback and we got a lot of and we got a little bit of negative feedback. But overall it was feedback that wasn't like um, limited within like our questions that we'd ask them on our survey because it was like we would just get like their honest opinion on things, the things that like were most important to them would come out in that sense. Um that they thought the app was convenient um, and easy to use. Um, some disliked the color scheme, but um, it's kind of where they ranked that it's more functionally um, so for some of the strengths, um, they were able, they were actually able to pay, we didn't make them actually pay for parking, but they were able to get to that part right before they actually submit a payment, um, and they were able to create an account without any assistance. Um, the icons did have labels, um, however, the user's needs may not have been met in that tab like more, they just had to look, click more and then see what was in the more option. Um, positioning of kind of the search bar on the top or, or like where you can add the um, zone number and then the bottom navigation is pretty standard throughout most apps. Um, it's more convenient to pay with an app rather than walk over to a pay station um, and that once you have an account created, the use of the system is very simple. Um, some shortcomings, the app doesn't always communicate with parking enforcement. I've had it happen a few times where I've paid for parking but in a certain lot that traditionally, you before you had to print out a receipt and it was like posted like on your dash. So some of the parking enforcement weren't aware that they switched over to the app. So they gave me a ticket because they didn't see the receipt on my dash, but they'd actually transferred to the app. And the parking enforcement just didn't know that. 
Um, and then sometimes the location services are inconsistent where like your car is actually parked. Mine for like three months was glitched on, it thought I was always in downtown Minneapolis on this one road. But my car, I knew it was like in East River Flats by the boathouse. So it, it just never got away from that. I just deleted the app and then reinstalled it and that's fine. But um, so the location services are not always consistent. Um, it's a simple color scheme, but it's not like super exciting. Um, and there's no in-app assistance. If someone were to be struggling and couldn't get their payment method to work, you have to go to a different website and then it takes you away from the app and then you have to go back to the app to fix it. But if you only have your phone with you, you're trying to like look up something, but also troubleshoot at the same time, you have to keep switching back and forth between Safari and your app. And if your phone is slow, that's problematic. So these are the design claims that was essentially in the description in the App Store. Um, it's convenient with free registration taking less than two minutes. Uh, the registration part, the creating an account part, did take less than two minutes. It was only once you had to kind of add a payment method and enter a zone. So we do agree with that. Um, it takes the stress out of parking, not 100%. Again, because it sometimes will charge you twice or not connect with parking enforcement. And certain zone numbers, for some reason, don't work with the app. So it doesn't work for every parking space around the city of Minneapolis. Um, you can extend the session on the go where permitted. This was untested because we didn't want to actually force people to pay for parking. So we couldn't test and extend the function without making them pay for parking. And you can register multiple vehicles to one phone number. There was no problem with kind of adding multiple vehicles on that add vehicle page. So some recommendations. Um, we want to get kind of a getting started tutorial for people, kind of they have the option to say like, okay, here's the very simple introduction of how we do the steps. Um, um, widely, one thing that we think we would recommend is that uh, prompt the user to create an account first before they do anything else on the app. Um, and then make an option to make payments for parking without creating, creating an account. So it wouldn't save your payment information, but it would allow you to get through it a little bit quicker on that first initial setup. So for someone who's not going to be using this app a lot, that might be a better option. Um, and then the map was a little bit distracting for some users. They'd say, like, well, I know where it is. I know the zone number. Why do I need to be seeing this map? Make that something that you can um, have the option to toggle on initially or something, have it be something you can toggle off. Um, update this color scheme and make icons to make it more aesthetically pleasing. It would do, do wonders in making it uh, just more appealing in general. And then work to ensure the app is consistently communicates to park enforcement so you don't get these things that people get fined and then they um, complain to the app because uh, law enforcement didn't understand it. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna ask, let's give this team a hand. I'm gonna ask team one to come up and start setting up uh, Questions for this team. So, uh, well, without waiting for the team one, I think it's kind of evident now that this is a much more challenging section of the course. Uh, we've seen a, a, an effort to evaluate a a design and interface with over a million users, or a hundred million, I forget what, um, with probably as many lines of code as any operating system. Uh, we've seen a very localized uh, application with maybe a few hundred or a thousand, few thousand users. Um, but in either case, the, the complications of figuring out what the heck is going on with these and how usable it is are uh, extremely formidable. And I think the two teams we've seen have done a terrific job, and uh, we'll see how this team does. <laughs> Thanks for the pressure. Well, both, let's see, all three teams today are guinea pigs. I've said that, and I'll say it again. Because I have not commented yet in lecture on the uh, theory and the scientific and the practical implications of usability testing, which are 
are really uh, interesting compared with dealing with the product. He won. Here's our design, our design example that changes like the way you behave. So we did an outlet wall power strip, and you can buy them in kind of any different way. You can get a surge protector, multiple, be multiple outlets. It can even be on a swivel and have USB ports, so you can plug in way more than you could originally plug in. So that changes maybe what you put in, you know, where you place things in your house. So it changes your behavior that way. So an overview and. Overview. Talk about the features and functions, the view of Google Forms, the heuristics, usability, conceptual survey, conclusions, our claims, and then recommendations. So Google Forms, the features and functions, it allows users to create a custom form and survey, like questionnaire for different people, and they can customize their surveys, collaborate with others, and gather certain data that they're looking for in a spreadsheet and then analyze the data right in the Google Sheets. So this is what the drop-down menu looks, and it's like on the main Google page on the right top-hand corner. So then you go to Drive. You go to Drive, which brings you here, and then you click New, which is in the top left-hand corner. Then you go to More, and then Google Forms is right there. And it brings you to the Start page where you have created the bidding form, and then you get to customize it and add whichever questions you want. So this is our group ranking. Um, so I'm just going to talk about functionality because that's what we rated the highest. Um, so kind of overall, our thinking behind it was we don't really use any other survey technology besides Google Forms. And so that's probably why we ranked it the highest, because it performed the function that we needed needed it, it, it to. Um, <laughs> but the visual design is kind of lacking because you just have to guess what the buttons mean because they don't really describe it well. And also it's just kind of boring. Um, and so then our heuristic analysis, so looking at usability, options of forms, and kind of ease of use because it's pretty simplistic. Uh, preference, you're able to customize it as you want. Um, gives multiple design options. Again, customization, blank forms, templates. Um, and then it's pretty minimalistic. Um, as you can see, there are like, two colors. Keeps it pretty straightforward. Um, layout, you kind of just have to guess based on uh, like what these icons mean. Performance. Um, speed of website, ease of use, again. And then additional heuristics, readability, the font size is pretty large and bolded. Um, everything is organized pretty clear. Uh, help and documentation takes you through a tutorial at the beginning if need be. A lot of people kind of just choose to do it independently anyways. Um, but there's help if you need it. And uh, visual clutter. There isn't a whole lot going on when you start off, so there are kind of just a few options that um, you can pick to start off. Uh, our demographics, um, we had four not familiar to fairly familiar. Uh, everyone used Google Chrome and Macs, but uh, as you can see, our range was from 17 years old to 48, which is pretty wide. Um, and then uh, these are our tasks that we had our subjects perform, anywhere from going to your email and finding Google Forms from there, as you saw us walk you through um, with our pictures earlier, create a new Google Form, add someone to collaborate, uh, three different types of questions, and distribute the form to others. Um, the one that took the longest was add three different types of questions, obviously, um, but it was hard because the drop-down menu had so many options that people didn't really know what ones to pick or what they meant based on their descriptions. 
And then verbal and nonverbal feedback. Um, I have no idea where to go. I see Drive, but where's Google Forms? Because Google Forms isn't necessarily listed when you first go to Drive. So you kind of have to go through multiple steps to reach it. Um, nothing is labeled. This is the first time I've used this. But I like that it's kind of showing me and telling me what to do. Um, I've used other programs, but not Google Forms. I'm assuming send means that I should distribute this to others. And then nonverbal, there was a lot of frustration and mouse movement. Um, intuition kind of had to take its course. And there were some unsure actions as well. So then again, just reviewing the demographics that we use for the survey and then the ability to test um, both male and female, a large age range, and everyone used Google Chrome with different methods. So this is the result of our um, perceived quality rankings. So overall, it's around three, which is kind of low, three out of five. It's not great, but it's okay. Um, the higher scoring ones would be the design. Um, again, it's simple, kind of easy to use. And then the function also was highest, which um, you can kind of tailor it to what you need. And they found that they can use it on um, platforms as well. So then comparing that with the Google form design claims. Um, so Google says that it allows you to get your responses fast because you just email it out and typically everyone has a computer. And we found that that was pretty true. And then they also said that there's a lot of room to stylize your surveys and kind of choose based on what you're needing the form for. And that kind of seemed to also hold true. Um, collaboration also scored high. Just being able to work with other people in an efficient way seemed good. Um, so then this is our results just overall. So the average ranking of the one quality was only a two out of seven. So there's room for improvement there. In, um, some of that could be the lack of instructions when you first start and actually getting to the form is hard. Um, and then overall they scored higher on the perceptual surveys. And then this is just kind of comparing our personal ratings with our participants. Um, we, for the most part, had higher ratings and Usually college students are familiar with forms, so it could be kind of a learning curve that we have used them and created them more. Um, but concluding there, the content is pretty simple, basic. There's nothing really exciting about it. Um, there's multiple functions, which is good for the purpose. And then um, low, for interactivity, we had low participant rating being that they kind of didn't really feel like there was a direction on what to do or how to create the form. So then comparing the approaches, we found the usability testing was most helpful because we were able to see them, um, their body language and see what they were saying, kind of watch them go through it and watch them succeed or struggle. Um, the heuristics only talked about how it could be applied based on opinion rather than fact and actually doing, making the form. And then our perceptual results um, were again just ranking based on numbers, which leads up to opinion a lot. Um, and in that case, we weren't able to see verbal and nonverbal feedback. So then, some positives about Google Form is that it allows for best response. So this holds pretty true on the kind of, once you send out, send out the form, you kind of are relying on the people who you are um, wanting to answer your form for the response. Again, you can stylize it. There's many templates, different types of questions, and then you can also just start blank and create your own. Um, it is fairly responsive, the user is able to create and edit and apply to forms more once they're familiar with how they work. 
and the more you're familiar with it, the faster it will be. And then also you can collaborate with other people pretty easily. Um, so some of my recommendations were beginning to just make the forms easier to find. To get to it, it's kind of hard. I mean, I use forms a lot, but I always, takes me a while to actually get to the page to start one. And then more direction for starting a form, um, maybe like a tutorial video or something, or directions that pop up to kind of be like, oh, this is what you do, click here. And then some of our users found that they wanted more ways to personalize their items. So just different types of forms, different questions, maybe different colors. Questions. questions for this team. Well, I have a question on the last bullet there on that slide. Um, you actually, you mean as a, as a team members, you actually use this application yes. for forms? Yeah. In, in your opinion, do you, do you agree? Well, let's take the sub. The first sub bullet over the last bullet. Have you found that there are kind of, there are forms you'd like to create that this application does not handle? Not necessarily. I mean, I use them for academic purposes usually, and so it's pretty simplistic. But um, I think if I wanted to use it in like my career and send out a survey through that. I mean, I know that there would probably be more advanced ways to send out a survey in like, your job, because you know they can afford to spend money on that compared to us who are poor. Um, but I think it would be interesting to see how you can like personalize when you send it out so it's not like purple. So whenever you send out a form, it's always purple and weird. But I think if you were able to like create your own kind of question instead of having to do necessarily like short answer or multiple choice just to like have a wider range of that. I think that would be beneficial. Well, uh, yeah, you seem to understand where I'm coming from, but let's take an example for all three presentations. Let's say you wanted to create a form with a simple Likert scale. Mm -hmm. Use of the Likert scale is extremely uh, broad, extremely popular. Many, many applications, not only in academically, but in some businesses use a Likert scale. Could you, could you find a Likert scale on that? It's not called a Likert scale, but it is. Oh, there is there one. Is there is one. On okay. There. Yeah. Well, then you've answered the question. <laughs> so they seem to have. Have you ever come across a form that you'd like to see there but is not there? Again, like it's it's pretty simplistic what I do anyways. Okay. But I think it it depends. I kind of always make the same questions. So I, it gets the job done, but I think if other people were to use it, I understand why they would want more options of what to do. Okay. Any other questions? Let's give this team a hand. All right, so uh, I'm going to ask each team to send me their presentation sort of by the end of the week or the weekend. Um, I, I think all three presentations today have been terrific. Uh, um, and apparently the guidance that has been provided was, was useful. Uh, I, I hope you're all uh, impressed or struck by the complexity of this, the assignment. Um, these I mean, all, all three presentations dealt with a, a website application. These websites are, can be uh, complex, sophisticated, um, very broad, and the idea of using the usability test to explore them, it, 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 you know, if you 
stand back and think about it can be somewhat formidable. So that's what we're going to talk about next week. Some of the some of the issues in usability testing in terms of its practical uh, significance, in terms of its scientific uh, significance, and how, how you really should think about usability testing as as uh, as not only a, a useful tool, of course that's what it claims, but also a tool that, that has some consistency, reproducibility, and reliability. We're going to find out that there's some issues there. Any questions about where we're going? Thank you for your attention. See you next week.